The address is CBS. Welcome home. Folks, and welcome back, everybody. We are live again tonight on October the 26th, 1998. I'm Tom, and the color cast is on the air from CBS with Joan London of ABC tonight. And Steve Wynn, who opened uh, the Bellagio Hotel over in Las Vegas last week to great reviews, a lot of publicity, and uh, some wonderful art is there. And I want to talk about Las Vegas in a second, but I want to talk today about... Uh, I had a stress test this afternoon. 396 miles of Cal uh, uh, U.S. Interstate Highway 5 from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And you know, don't you love these people, these guys, who you're going along at about 65 and the speed limit is 70, and you want to pass this guy. So as you pull out to pass him, he increases speed right along with you so you can't get past, okay? Then you get behind him again, he slows it right back down to 62. Then you pull out and you try to pass on the left, he's up there to 75, 70. And it took me 100 miles to lose this guy. It's unbelievable. And then... I finally get to Los Angeles, and my house is like eight stoplights from the freeway off-ramp that I use. And I f I'd forgotten this, and a week away from L.A., I missed every single stoplight getting home. And I've got a dog, Ollie, in the back seat who's been holding it now for five hours, okay? <laughs> and I've got fine Corinthian leather back there, okay? I'm saying, you know, Ollie, it would really be helpful if you didn't dump the, the upholstery, you know what I mean? But uh, hey, welcome back to Los Angeles, where every day is an experience, not necessarily a good one. Anyway, Steve Wynn is here from Vegas tonight. And I, I'm sure that many of you have been over there. The first time I went was back in 1971 or 72. And I was working news at uh, Channel 4 NBC here in Los Angeles. And my, my salary at the time was $55,000 a year, which I thought was the sun, the moon, and the stars in 1970 and 71. So the first night there, a bunch of us, including David Horowitz, the consumer advocate, right? Uh, fight back with David Horowitz. He and I and some other people from uh, NBC went to the, uh, to the dice table at Caesar's Palace. And about 4.15, 4.30 in the morning, my then wife came. She says, she, she says we're going to go out now and we're going to see the sunrise over Hoover Dam. At the time, I was plus $4,800. I said, I'm not leaving this table. We finally quit at 8 o'clock in the morning. And so help me, my first time in Vegas, I'm up $5,200, and I'm earning $55,000 a year. I went to bed for a while, and I called my agent in Los Angeles, my friend Ed. I said, call NBC and tell them I won't be back to report the news on Monday. He said, why not? I said, Ed, I'm plus five Gs here in six hours. I said, why should I work 48 weeks a year for a lousy, stinking 55 Gs when I can make five grand a day here for 10 days and live right here in Las Vegas and have great food and, and, and make my money at the tables? He said, well, I'll, I'll call NBC tomorrow afternoon. I said, absolutely. I said, because, you know, I, he said, by the way, if you change your mind, be sure to call me back. I said, okay. Well, we went back to the table. <laughs> And 45 minutes later, the 5,200 was gone, about two or 3,000 more was gone, and we stopped gambling and went, got a bite to eat and headed for the car to come home. And I went back to the room to pack up. I called out on the phone. I says, by the way, there's no need to call NBC. <laughs> Tell them I will be in tomorrow to report the news. And I learned that day. You can gamble for a living or you can work for a living, but never try to combine the two. It doesn't work. And I'm sure Steve Wynn would, would, would second that, right? If you want to gamble, do it for recreation and work for a living. If you want to gamble for a living, then don't work. Just gamble. It's an interesting lifestyle. A lot of people go to Vegas, you know, in a $40,000 Mercedes-Benz, if there is still such a thing, and they come home in a $95,000 Greyhound. <laughs> <laughs> Leave the driving to, to us. Yeah. From ABC, Joan London here tonight, and then Steve Wynn and Tales of Bellagio in Las Vegas, and I hope in Italy, and you on the toll-free. I'm Tom. You're watching CBS, and thank you for catching our pictures as we fly them through the air.
When Joan London left Good Morning America after a 20-year association with GMA, she was facing a major life change. Besides readjusting her sleep schedule, she had to readjust her life, a daunting assignment for anybody. But a phrase of encouragement from a special friend helped ease the way, and it became the title of her new book called A Bend in the Road is Not the End of the Road, Ten Positive Principles for Dealing with Change. And it's a pleasure to welcome Ms. London to our late-night program here at CBS. Nice there is that. life after television five days a week, <laughs> ain't there, huh? Absolutely. <laughs> and, but you know something? Even though I had been wanting to get off that schedule and had been kind of moaning about it for a year or two, when the reality hits, it is bigger and scarier than you imagine. I'll get to that, but did, did, did you have trouble getting to sleep or getting up in the morning after you left that program? Did you have like any kind of sleep disorders? Hey, it, after, took after 20 a, years it took me a while. It took me about seven or eight months to get over the sleep deprivation and to probably find out what my sleep pattern really was, my, right. my normal sleep cycle. But I mean, I just reveled in not having to get up at 345 anymore. And did the alarm ever go off at the wrong time, once or twice? You know something, about two months ago, there was a storm in the, in the area, and the alarm went off. So you jump out of bed, and then when you realize it's just a power surge, you reset it. And I got back in bed and looked at the alarm clock. It was 3.45. Hello. And I thought, I used to think that I got up early in the morning. This is the middle of the night. I can sleep for four or five more hours. <laughs> I want to ask you about your move from California to New York. We both did that back That's in the right. 70s. About you were, the same time. You were working at a station in Sacramento, California. Right. I would assume that before the move to New York came, you were happy and well-adjusted in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they dangled the carrot of NYC before young Joan London. What kind of heady wine was that for you? Well, you know, I was a big duck in a little pond. And I was also still just learning. And then all of a sudden, you get this offer to go to New York City because they were trying to put women on the air at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was scary, and I remember going to New York and thinking, you know, I was a street reporter for the first time in the streets of New York, and it was really hard. It was just like being thrown into the deep end and saying, you know, swim. That's right. And it was really tough. And, and I had guys like, I don't you remember Roger Grimsby? Yes, I do, fondly. God a, rest his soul. A very tough, grisly guy there as an anchor in New York, and, and he really wanted to make sure that I, you know, learned what I was doing. Well, there are people who work in news in New York and in Los Angeles, I suppose everywhere, who when somebody young and new joins the staff, that new person has to prove that he or she is a real journalist yes. and was born, if not in the city room of the New York Times, at least close by, and had printer's ink in his or her veins by the age of seven. Huh? I remember when I first went to New York, the writers would write copy for me when I anchored the... Shining ships sailed into the South Street Seaport on the Sunday afternoon. I mean, they would write me things to just try to trip me up, yeah. to give then, me a hard time. And then if time. you did, they'd be up in the newsroom saying, ah, oh, there oh, she goes. Oh, they would yeah. laugh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what about, like, the first assignment where you have to go out with a New York film crew because these guys and gals know the streets and, and, you know, they know their turf? Those are the people who really taught me what to do. Because I'd been an anchor back in Sacramento. I had never really been a street reporter. And thank God for all of them. And they taught me, and I'll never, ever forget going on my first story to the Supreme, State Supreme Court of New York for a bombing and conspiracy trial. I'd been in a courtroom once to fight a parking ticket, you know. I mean, I'd never been to anything like this. And as we got out of the car, he went around the back and he opened up the trunk and he said, how many magazines do you want? <laughs> to which, of course, I replied, Oh, I don't think I'll have any time to read any magazines. <laughs> well, after they picked themselves up off the ground of hysterical laughter, they explained to me, back in those days, of course, we used film cameras. That's right. And the magazines are the, house the film. The reels of film, And right. you can have a magazine of, you know, 700 feet or 1,200 feet or 1,500 right. feet. And they knew they had their work cut out for, <laughs> for them at that point. And I knew to be real nice and ask lots of questions. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I worked at WABC years later, they still told that story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. I remember the first time I went out with an L.A. crew, the guy's name was Tom Brannigan. 
He came up to me, he said, look, he says, I'm Tom Brannigan, I'm your cameraman. He said, if you like my work, I'll expect you to tell me. If you don't like my work, please call my union office. And he gave me the phone number. He says, because I don't have time to mess with you. I, I thought to myself, <laughs> ask these guys a lot of questions and do what they tell you. So you worked there at Channel yeah. 7 for a while with, uh, with Brother Four Grimsby and Bill now. Butel, okay. And then along comes the, uh, the, the Good Morning America, right? Well, the thing about being in New York on local news is that all the executives are there, the executive producers nice, of all yeah. the network shows, <laughs> and they see you on the local news. So they asked me to come over to Good Morning America as a consumer reporter and then to fill in for Nancy Dusso, who was the first. Oh, a yeah, name from the past. See? Huh? Yeah. But she was the co-host for the first few years. Yeah. And then it came time to change, and I was up for the job. But I didn't get it. And it was a good thing. I wasn't ready for okay. it. It would have been way too intimidating for me at the time. And so then I filled in for Sandy Hill, who was right. the next person. The, the next person, right. And then... And like, was David Hartman there through all this? Yes. Was he there from day one? Yes, from day one. But now, wasn't there a show before Good Morning America? Yes. Um, Bill Butel and... I think it was called Good Day America. I can't... I can't recall. And it was Bill Butel and Stephanie Edwards. Right, from Los Angeles, right. There you go. And... Then David was brought in, and he had been on primetime shows. I think the last show is Lucas Tanner. Right, which I call Lucas Tanner, M.D. <laughs> yes, right, 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 right. <laughs> and, and David was with me throughout the whole thing, and then finally when David left, uh, Charlie came in, and that was a pretty seamless transition yes, at the it was. time. But it let's, was. let's go back now to you. You're up for the job, and Sandy Hill gets it. Now, do you continue on as a consumer reporter and continue working at Channel 7? I continued doing double duty, you know, right. going out and doing a couple stories a day, right. anchoring at night, and then also coming in in the morning whenever she was off or on assignment, mm -hmm. and I'd fill in for her. And so then when did she leave, and then you, you started the show? I think she went away to the Olympics at one point in and February, and she back. never came back. <laughs> she and David didn't really get along that great, I don't think. And so I was called in. You know, I, I was called actually in by David Hartman's agent. Really? Which is rather unusual, but I went in and I did an interview with him, and he said, um, you realize you're going to be second banana, oh. and you don't have any problem with this. Oh. And I said, second banana on Good Morning America is still a really good job. Yep. So, and, and I remember when I first started there, Barbara Walters came in one morning, and she said, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. Don't buck City Hall. You see where it got the last two. They are not ready to give you the big interviews. Not you, but just a woman, right. period. Or the second banana. The second banana, In other yes. words, the star of the show is David Hartman. Right, and, they, and I was not allowed to be called co-host. It was in David's contra contract that I could not be called co-host. I think I was called the in-studio reporter interview or something. I don't know. I was just, it was like a euphemism. To just whatever you do, don't you know, call you know, her yeah, a co-host. Yeah, but you know what's amazing? Like, like, I've known Hartman a long time. Hartman, when he was dating his wife, uh, uh, Maureen, who yeah. passed away, God yeah. rest her soul. Uh, Hartman used to, he would hang around with the San Francisco Giants and play baseball. Uh -huh. He'd come over and, and, and Maureen worked on a show I did here in L.A. And Hartman was always ha hanging around. He's a good the guy. Sunday show. Yeah, the Sunday show. Yeah. I can't imagine Hartman putting in his contract, I don't want so-and-so being called a You know, I'm going to tell you something. He came, he was really put into that show as the star of the show. That's right. And there wasn't supposed to be another star of the show. And it really, I mean, it was, it was set up almost like Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon. And, and in his defense, and I think anything that was put into his contract was just to protect him and his right, role and, on the and program. His position it there, wasn't sure. against the female on the show. And he really taught me everything, and he showed me the ropes. Oh, he's a great guy. He's been here. He's he a terrific was guy. So terrific to me all those years on the show. And a lot of women, they used to call, they would write me and they would complain and say, you know, you know, it's, it's a disgrace to the women's movement that you are not getting more on the show. And I would write him back and say, you know something? I have one of the best damn jobs in television. As long as I stay here and I could do a good job at what they're giving me now, uh, it'll grow. Exactly. And that's exactly what happened. We're chatting with Joan London, whose book is called A Bend in the Road is Not the End of the Road. The toll free is up and running. We'll be right back with Joan and you, I hope, after this break. We are back with Joan London on the toll free. Here is Rich in Chicago. Hi, Rich, and welcome to CBS. Hello. Hi, Tom. How are you? I'm fine, Rich, and I hope you are. How's everything in Chicago tonight? Uh, not too bad. It's actually warmed up here. Oh, very good. Very good. What's on your mind, Rich? Well, I'd like to ask Joan a question. Okay. Um, Joan, I'm curious. Um, you're so down to earth. Do you have really like a wild side? 
<laughs> a wild side. Oh, yeah. we, I, you know, there is kind of, I, there's an adventurous spirit that I don't necessarily think was there when I was younger that kind of emerged as I, maybe as you get more confidence as you get older, which has set me off on, you know, climbing mountains and let doing me, let things. Let me ask you a question about when you, when, when you went to New York in the 70s. Uh -huh. you, you were a, a, a young person then, right? Right, I was about 24. Okay, now, when you went to New York for the first six months, did you go nuts? I mean, I, I, no. I, I didn't really, I didn't know anybody, I mean... Well, you don't have to know anybody in New York. You just yeah. go into a bar and you... But when you're the, the, the low man on the totem pole at a, yeah. new, at a news operation, you get all the bum shifts. I worked six, seven days a week. I would work my shift, and if anybody else was out, you, you're afraid to say no. You know, of course I'll come in then. What is the wildest thing you've ever done in your life? Either as a teenager... Crazy, or... dumb things. I mean, it probably was my bungee jump. But, you know, I'll tell you something. When I got divorced... You know, I, I had I wasn't really wild as a in my te my twenties when I went to New York right. and and I got married and had three children and when I got divorced I didn't date anybody for about three years and then you want to go out and kind of rejoin life. Sure. And of course you feel like a teenager again. You feel like an idiot when you go out on dates again. And you know at that point though if I would go out and be seen anywhere every it's every, you're, it's reported on every time you go anywhere well, during your divorce and I don't want to dwell on that because enough has been uh, has yeah. been said about that but in the tabloids you know rammed it to you day after day after day but then in your case once the divorce was over with as unpleasant as that was they kept after you I mean yeah, I, you I, become I, a target and I don't know I mean certain people become targets and I obviously was one of them but it, the idea that they would follow my social life yeah. I mean, like, why would anybody care who I was going out with? That one really caught me by surprise. Yeah. Uh, Rich, I guess she's not terribly wild. Well, that's, that's fine. I mean, uh, we all love her back here in Chicago. She just looks, uh, she just looks wild, Rich, but she's really not. <laughs> Tom, I got a question for you. Okay. I know you're going to be leaving, and yep. I was just curious. Um, have you ever thought of a late-night show here in Chicago? We've never had one. <laughs> no, no I, to tell you the truth, I haven't, but you know something? I, th there's a man out there who did a show for a long time called... Uh, uh, cup show, you know, or of cups in it yeah. with the Chicago Tribune. Oh, you're right. And uh, y you know, I was thinking of maybe something along that line on a on a less frequent than one night basis, but I don't have time to go into it now, Rich. Okay. Okay, but thanks for asking. Okay, Tom. All right, bye bye now. Bye bye, Joan. Bye bye, Tom. Bye. Goodbye, Rich. You know what David Hartman left for the world? I don't know if you noticed this when you worked with him. Like you know, I'm sitting okay. now looking at you. Mm -hmm. Hartman would always do it like this, okay? You're right. And it stretches out the old loose yeah. skin, you know what I mean? Well, he's really tall, Yeah, too. well, so am I. How tall are you? 6'4". All right, that's what he, he was 6'4". Yeah. And, and then Hartman would do this, you see? And then all oh, this looks great. See, this is, now this is the full Hartman, see? Then there's, then, there, then, <laughs> there, then there's the half Hartman here, and then there's the reverse Hartman, see? <laughs> well, do you know that one time Saturday Night Live did a little bit on David yeah, yeah. and me, and, and I was a blow-up doll. <laughs> <laughs> they just sat there and said nothing. <laughs> you know, and th I mean, that's all part of, you know, it's all part of the business. It's Absolutely. all part of just coming Listen, along. And I, I was flattered that Dan Aykroyd did a parody of me sure. on Saturday Night Live, as I'm sure you should have been flattered when they, Absolutely. you know, they only parody people who are successful. They don't parody yeah. flops, I can tell you. Now, you talked about you wanted to leave the show. Yet when the time came, it's a whole different thing. How, how did you learn that the end was in sight at Good Morning America? Well, you know, I thought that the kind of the writing was on the wall when the news took over because, I mean, you know, it's human nature when you come in and all of a sudden, you, you know, you get ownership of something. You want to put in your own people. Right. You want to put your fingerprint on it. And in the case of Good Morning America, the entertainment division did not control the show. The news division well, got Well, the entertainment division had controlled the show for 17 years, and the news had always wanted it. Right. So all of a sudden, when they got control of it... They want the real journalists in there, Joan. And they said, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and uh, we aren't going to touch you. But they really felt that we were lower down the food chain somehow because we weren't part of ABC News. And I just really felt that, that they would change it. And within a month we had a new logo, within mm -hmm. another month we had new colors, and then we had a new set. And it was only inevitable that they were going to change hosts. I did want to get off the show because that... After 20 toll, years, of course. It was just taking a physical toll on me, and I really wanted some normalcy in my life. Sure. 
I want to be able to hang out at my house at night and not feel like sure. I had to go sure. to sleep at 9 o'clock. By the way, it's the same here. You know, coming here yeah. night after night after night, you never go to dinner, you never go to theater, yeah. you never see a movie, you never play cards. You come here and work, which is okay for a while, but there comes a time when you but say... But 20 years. Yeah, exactly. I remember when Charlie Gibson first came to the show and I said, this is the show where you will get invited to everything and you can go to nothing <laughs> because you have no life. Uh. And, but then when they finally call and say, okay, we're making the change. Now, who called? Um, somebody, probably David Weston, I would imagine. But whoever it was, they called my agent, mm -hmm. and my agent called me. And I had been saying to them every day, because I was doing interviews all the time, because everyone was writing about how GMA was changing and it mm -hmm. was going down in the ratings. And finally, I called them that morning because I had a big interview with um, TV Guide. And I wanted to know, like, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. We don't know. So you do the whole interview with TV Guide, and you try to put on the happy face. Dance around and it. And that, I came home from the interview. The phone was ringing. It was my attorney and my agent and said, they're making the change. And it's just like this bolt of lightning goes through you because you can moan about it all you want. But all of a sudden, when you realize that you are going to leave that comfort zone you've been in for 20 years, mm -hmm. everything you really know, and you're going to go out there and have to recreate something and you ask those questions like was that possibly as good as it gets yeah <laughs> will i be able to recreate right. something else will i be good at something else i mean you just you have to ask yourself all those questions so it's a scary proposition for anyone going through change like now that. the last day what what happened that last day everything go just fine no first of all that morning i took the longest shower in the world because i was giving myself a pep talk because everybody who had been interviewing me said Oh, how are you ever going to get through the show? You're going to cry. It's going to be so sad. I didn't want it to be that. And that's not how I felt about it. I wanted it to be a celebration of 20 amazing right. years. Right. And I wanted people to look at it as a beginning of my next whatever, even though I didn't know what it was going to be. And I got out of the shower that morning. And it's funny how I always used to know whether the driver was out in front or whether there was someone else. I don't know how. I just always had the feeling. and right. I. Something just didn't quite feel right, and I went and I looked out the front door. There was no car. No car. They didn't pick me up the last morning. And what's funny is that the first day I ever went to Good Morning America, which is, and Jamie, my little Jamie was, I don't know, seven weeks old, and I went out and got in the car with her. I, and I'm thinking, what am I doing? I have a new baby. I hardly know how to take care of a baby. I'm going to a new network show. It's 4 o'clock in the morning, yeah. and it's... halfway in, the car broke down. Mm -hmm. So we had to get out and get a taxi to take us the rest of the way in. And I just thought, how ironic is life? Did the car take you home after the show? And I'll tell you, <laughs> and I, and I'll tell you why I asked this. All the times, I, I, never, I, I was never on Good Morning America, but I was on the Today Show as a guest now and again. And I'd be at the hotel. Oh, yes. They would come and get you at 6 o'clock. Because they want to make sure you're there. But when you're through at 8.30... You're on your own, You're on baby. your own. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you something, though. They had a little party afterwards. And as we were still celebrating, I'm, I'm telling you, we needed hard hats. They were in there t ripping apart the studio, ripping things out to put in a brand new set oh, sure. so that it would oh, look sure. completely different yeah. on Monday morning. Yeah. It's like, could you hurry up and have that last ship of champagne there? I and hope the last night here. here that when we're, when, we're, when we're on the other, they just cart all this crap out of here. You know, we, we, you want to take this home, though. This could be really cool. This is the property of like Worldwide Pants room? and CBS, and when, the, when, when I'm through, they can have it. It's theirs to keep. <laughs> I, I thank them for loaning it to me. I have to pause for our sponsors. Back for a couple of more minutes here with Joan London. Still ahead, Steve Wynn and Bellagio in Las Vegas and Italy. And you on the toll free after this short timeout. We are back with uh, with Joan London. Now, you you refer in this in, in in the book. You've dedicated this book to your three children and to a person yeah. that you identify as your life mate. Without getting into him, where do we come up with the term life mate? Because that that has an implication that sometimes is not true. Well, I just I, I think you know. And I'm sure that you and he are never idea. ever 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 going to be apart in the history of the world. And and I know it's never going to happen. But but the word life mate intrigues me. Well, I think that you find somebody that you just really totally trust that is your biggest supporter okay. and was, you know, my unbelievable support, all, you know, through the last year and a half, who you enjoy spending all your time with. It's funny, I never used to think that I could spend so much time with a guy mm -hmm. 
and we're together all the time, and we always have fun. I don't get tired of being with him. And he loves my girls. My girls love him. Good. And that's always a tough thing, you know, when you, for, you know, women out there who are divorced and have children, mm -hmm. it's not so hard to find somebody that might like you, but we do, we come, you know, as a package That's deal. right. That's right. There's some baggage here that, uh, yeah. you know, is part and parcel so of our life. So you kind of wonder, will yeah. I ever find somebody again that I really, really, really want to be with who also will fit into my life and my lifestyle? Not to mention I have a lifestyle that comes along with the job and with, be in the public eye. I mean, there's just so much that you have to expect a guy to deal with. Um, it's tough, you know. It's mm -hmm. a lot to expect of someone. And you're about to go back into the the uh, the, the the daily talk show fray, as, yes. as it were. The, I know. I know you think I'm nuts. It's, I think you're crazy. I mean, you know, you got more money than God, <laughs> and why you would go very, in there? It's a very competitive marketplace. I just think it's the, the obvious next step, and it's what I will enjoy doing. It's what I want to do. Okay. So, I mean, you know, I really stepped back. I mean, the big challenge was not to accept something right away, which I feel very compelled to do always to know, have your ducks lined up. And I really sat back and said, what do you want to do? What, you, what do you really, really want to do with this 20 years of experience and, mm -hmm. a, and a really wonderful, loyal audience out there? And I decided that, that I really wanted to try my hand at a day So, like, how many show. specials do you do for ABC a year uh, with the present arrangement you have there? This last year, four specials. Four. So when you leave, somebody would have to do those four specials for ABC, wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> That's where I come in. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we can do a little trade here. Yeah, you're going to have to go through this a similar... Not at all. You know, I'm, I'm ready. I, I, listen, I'm so ready for graduation, I can't tell you. But I was ready for graduation, too. I was really ready and wanted it. But when the change comes... It, it is a very unusual experience. There's one difference between you and me. What's that? I'm 62. I'm ready for graduation, <laughs> okay? Thanks for coming in, young lady. It's yeah, a joy it's to see you. It's great to be here. Okay. Joan London is the guest, and the book is called A Bend in the Road is Not the End of the Road. Next, the amazing Steve Wynn, the man who was remaking Las Vegas, after these messages. As much as any of its visionaries, Steve Wynn has transformed the mecca of Las Vegas again and again. He joins us tonight to talk about his newest accomplishment, the Artville Bellagio Hotel. A pleasure to welcome my friend Steve Wynn to our show here at CBS. It's a shame that this hotel got no publicity before it opened, huh? You were everywhere. Low keyed. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you about the real Bellagio. You've been there in Italy, have you not? Yes. Yeah, tell me when you went there. What, wasn't that the inspiration for the entire project? Uh, Elaine and I went with our friends Paul and Annie Anka two years ago. We had actually done the design work on the hotel. And the architecture of the Lombardy Lakes are, is quite the same as, for example, that you see on the Mediterranean from Portofino to Monte Carlo or Cannes. The, the stucco buildings, the tile roofs, the small gardens, the human scale. But we, we went out with a friend of ours, Gil, who owns Farniente Wines on his boat. He had rented a home there for the summer. And we went for lunch at the town of Bellagio. It's a charming place. Isn't it just wonderful? The best, huh? Yeah. And we were walking around. Those and streets we up and down. You know, went yeah. up the hill and down a hill. Yeah, we did yeah, that whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And we got back on the boat, and Annie Anka had an Italian-English dictionary. And, I, you know, I, you and I play at Bel Air Country Club, right. and, and that's on Bellagio. I said, what does it mean? And I thought by mistake it meant Pretty Lake. Bel La it's not Bel Lago, though. It's Bellagio. And she, Annie opens up the Italian dictionary and it says a place of elegant relaxation not only is it a cute place but the, the meaning is like made in heaven for a hotel mm -hmm. and it's mellifluous yes. so we decided on the spot that that was it that's how it happened now, we how were staying you, at the Villa d'Este at the time how do you and by the way isn't that a wonderful hotel let me, let me ask you about hotels and, and I don't know you as a hotel man a hotelier in the United States sounds nice hotelier do you notice a difference when you go to a fine European hotel as compared to a fine United States hotel? Why is there such a difference? Traditionally, there has been. These days, you can get sort of an unpleasant jolt. You know, there's service has declined around the world a lot. The main difference, however, today is the quality of the food. European cooking traditions are wonderful. Aren't they, though? The average quality of food in a, in a Class A European hotel is off the charts com compared to an American True. hotel. That's, Tom, to me, the food's the big thing. Yeah. As far as Why I can can't see. we do it here that we way? We can now. Oh, we can? The amount of celebrity chefs that we're getting in America is growing rapidly. The James Beard Awards, 
The James Baird Foundation has been celebrating for a number of years now the achievements of great chefs in America. And when they have the James Baird Awards in May in New York, it's like the Academy Awards, mm -hmm. all the French chefs come and the Swiss guys. And we've got seven of them at the hotel. So food quality is the main difference. I think that as far as service goes, that the staffs of the better hotels in America are every bit as sweet and affectionate as they are anywhere in the world. I would agree. I would when you agree. go to France these days, you know, Tom, you do travel a lot. You get some jolting moments. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. But not, I've, not, never, not, I've never had a bad moment in Italy. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the funny thing. It's still I, warm and terrific. And, and the thing I, I wonder about, like, how many rooms in Bellagio? 2,000. 2, that's, 2, that's our number. <laughs> now, Mirage, Treasure Island. Did, 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 did you stay in any hotels? You mentioned Villa d'Este, which is a large hotel in, in uh, Chernobyl, Italy. Did you stay in any of the small hotels? Like four rooms, five rooms, eight rooms. No, I've been in, I've been in, I've been in one. Elaine and I have stayed in one in Switzerland that was like fourteen. Yeah. Chains of Grigiuna, in did, the Closters. Did Did, did you oh. like it? Oh yeah. Would you ever want to run a small hotel ever? I think everybody would. Yeah. It looks like it would be such, but it's very hard work. Oh, I know. You can't afford a big staff. Yeah, I know. You, you can, can do make, everything but, yourself. But you can make thirty-five, forty thousand a year. <laughs> in, in, in Closters, the Frau Frau Schmidt and her husband Schmidt, run the yeah. Chains of Grigiuna. And the, the, the quilts, the comforters, were this thick. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you sink in. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, it's good. It's yeah. delicious, huh? It is delicious. Now, what's gotten a big play in the, in the pre-opening publicity for Bellagio is the artwork which you brought to this hotel. Yes. Uh, and which you allow people to see. Wh where, did you, where did you assemble this collection? Have you had these paintings for a long time? Or no, is this, I haven't had them for a long time. These are recent acquisitions. Yes, the last two you, years. How did you find them? Private, uh, with the help of... Uh, an art dealer, a couple of art dealers, but mainly with the advice of a friend of mine, Bill Aquavilla, and others. You know, most of the most of the pieces of the 28 or 30 pieces we own, uh, except for three, that were bought at auction. The rest were bought privately. The, the the higher limits of art collecting is a small world. It's like the the entertainment business. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody know who's who's got this Monet and who's got that. Sure, Bengal. sure. And who's got this Cezanne? And which one is available? Which one is not? Yeah. Sure. Everybody knows which paintings Ambassador Anna Berg owns that are going to go to the Metropolitan right. Museum. Right. Uh, everybody knows what what, the, what what for the most part there are some mysterious mysterious collections in Europe. Old families they keep them stashed and nobody sees them. One of the paintings in our collection, a Degas ballerina was purchased by Baron Edmond Rothschild in an auction in 1918, and no one ever saw it since then. 60, 70, 70 years, 80 years, what am I saying? 80, uh, 79 years, exactly. The Rothschilds passed the painting generation to generation. People knew that it was there, but it was never seen. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, for some reason, out it comes to a private dealer, to us. Uh, you got to get lucky. When the art market is very low in prices, the top paintings don't sell because folks don't own them got money, and so they don't want to sell them. Yeah. When the art market goes up, some of them show up. But let me ask you this. You know, I, I, I have a small art collection, uh, nothing on your scale. But isn't it wonderful when you see a painting and it just speaks to you? When, when you just absolutely want it so badly? See, there's the sound of a collector. You've got the sickness. Yeah, I do. I do. Great pictures. You look at them, and, and all of a sudden, they have a presence. Yeah. Might as well have a speaker attached. That's to them. exactly correct. That's there exactly. is it. I saw. The but have you not experienced that? Where you, you, I, I did with my with the Doramar, yeah. the Doramar picture we own. A Picasso was painted in 1942. I had no interest in that period or that artist. And Bill Aquabella one day was trying to teach me something about Picasso, and he used this picture that he had in his gallery as an example. He brought this tough picture, you know, with this wasn't a sweet thing, into the room. And the picture of this woman haunted the room. Oh, yeah. She had a presence. was oh, as palpable oh, as you're oh, looking at me. Oh, I know. I know. When I was a I kid... I was struck by that. When I was a kid working in Atlanta, I never cared about art before. They brought Whistler's mother to the art gallery in Atlanta. The actual oil painting? Yeah, the actual oil from the Louvre in Paris. And a Raphael Mary Magdalene with the nightlight. And Raphael in Atlanta? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Just on exhibit, on loan from the Louvre. I see. And when you see Whistler's mother... Because it was in all of our books as kids, and you look, and, 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 and by the way, the, the, the title of the painting, I'm not trying to show off, it's, it's called An Arrangement in Gray and Black, because there's no color anywhere in the painting. Right. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Let me pause for a second. We'll talk about uh, the Bellagio Hotel and more stuff with Steve Wynn after this short break.
with Steve Wynn. Here is Jeff on the toll-free in Cincinnati. Hi, Jeff, and welcome to CBS Late Night. Hello. Yeah, hi, hi Tom. Hi, hi, Steve. Hi, Jeff. Yeah, I'd like to, well, I'd like to ask Mr. Wynn, uh, with, with the uh, riverboat casinos popping up all over the country, is, is there a measurable uh, negative impact on, on Las Vegas business, and is it tough to pull those people out there from these, all these towns? No. Uh, riverboats uh, have not uh, been a threat to Las Vegas. If anything, they've sort of awakened uh, the idea that it's a fun place to go with a lot of people. I think the riverboats have created more customers and people who enjoy that sort of thing now than there were before. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think so. It, 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 since you're an, a, an expert on the, the gaming or gambling business, what do you think the future is of uh, racetracks in the country with people now going to all these casinos that are popping up everywhere? Listen, I don't know if I'm an expert. Uh, I've survived for a while. I think parimutuel racing is basically in, in parimutuels things are in trouble. They've been uh, in, a, in a downward slide for quite some time. Too many other choices of entertainment and wagering in the world today, state lotteries, and, and more exciting, faster paced. If you really love horses, then of course the track is a wonderful place. But as a It's betting, like an art collector. If you like horses, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's a small group of Americans uh, and, and, and people. Horse racing has had a trouble competing with competitive, you know, with other forms of, of entertainment, not just other forms of gambling. So the general trend in terms of parimutuel stuff is down. Okay. And I don't see that changing much. Jeff, I'm glad you called. Very perceptive question. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, goodbye now. Do you have a dog in the fight that's currently going on in California vis-a-vis -vis Indian gambling? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, for the first time, I've always been a proponent of leaving the Indians alone. I've made speeches at Indian conventions when other people were sort of anti-Indian stuff. I've said, that's ridiculous. It's a free country. But Native Americans have been down so long, it looks like up in many cases. What's going on in California is a whole different story, however. Proposition 5 is all about uh, a couple of tribes, one of them with 25 members, all of them are multimillionaires spending 60 or 70 million. We're concerned about it in Nevada because it's unregulated and untaxed. The most important part They is say otherwise, you know. It's completely unregulated and untaxed. But they say otherwise, you yeah, know. Yeah, but there is no tax. I mean, it's just that simple. And you, you can play games and say that, they, uh, that, that if they employ someone, they pay a payroll tax. But there is no corporate tax. There is no gaming tax. There's none of those things that normal businesses pay. But the fact of the matter is we're always afraid that if there's widespread unregulated gaming, that there could be a chance of scandal, almost a certainty of abuse. If it's unregulated and there is an abuse, the federal government may come pick on us, too. They throw the baby out with the bat well, bath water. Mm -hmm. We've been wanting to have regulated gaming. And so I have been on the other side. I don't think it's going to make any difference, but I'm on the other side on this one for that reason. Let me ask you about, you know, all the articles that I've read and the television accounts I've seen portray the opening of Bellagio as a big swing on your part. They always mention this figure, the billions of dollars, the, you know. It costs a lot of money, Tom. Yeah, I understand that, but is it, is it Steve Wynn's money or is it uh, construction financing money? And, and not that that makes any difference, but is this a big swing for you? Could this... Oh, if, they always are. If, if you I, reach... I mean, if this thing goes belly up, does, this, does, it, does it change your lifestyle at all? No. It's one thing to risk your reputation. And I mean, I know your heart's in this and your gut. I know that. Okay. And it is a big swing. But the Mirage Resorts, the company that owns Bellagio, doesn't have a nickel of secured debt. We have a bank line for a billion seven fifty at the and, and some and we have some unsecured debt. When we open our ho open our hotel in a hundred days, Beau Rivage in Mississippi, we'll owe a couple billion dollars. The interest expense on that will be $150 million a year, which the Mirage, which Treasure Island and the Golden Nugget can pay without the Mirage, without Bellagio, and without Beau Rivage ever opening the doors. So it's one thing to, be a, to, to make a mistake in judgment, but it's another thing to be broke. And I'm too old to start over again. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, you're not. There'll be, there'll be no parts of going broke. No, no. The, 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 we didn't risk the farm. What we, what we did risk, however, is we've matched our judgment against what we perceive to be a changing times. The idea that gambling could somehow be so special that people could count on it to, to I got make 30 living. seconds, Dr. Okay. okay. We're trying to create a much richer, broader experience for a larger audience. Hopefully, they will respond. 
I really thank you for coming on. I know you've talked they to yourself. They don't. I won't be seeing you anymore. Oh, yes, you will. You'll <laughs> never, and I'll never stop saying hi to you at no the club. Matter. Okay. <laughs> Steve, thanks a million. Congratulations on your success. Thanks, Tom. Next time you come back, we'll talk about Mike, okay? Your pop? You bet. Okay, thank sure. you. Steve Wynn, the creator of the Bellagio Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada, back after this timeout. As he puts on his microphone and prepares to close the show. Have you noticed, like on the Leno show, they now clip the microphone on, you know, when they come on? And when Johnny was there, they had the boom mic. But, you know, cost-cutting at NBC. Lots of other stuff at NBC oh. today, too, which we won't go into. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, the irrepressible uh, Tony Curtis is here, and the pressable Chris Isaac will uh, join us as well. I hope you'll come back same time, uh, same station. Have you noticed that the older a man gets, the more miles he had to walk to school? <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs>